Robert Mayak. Original from his well, then WWF days and 300 Pacific Rim. Quite the resume on this guy right here and uh, fellow Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're gonna go around. We'll uh, we'll ask some questions. Uh, I don't think you guys will need the microphone since uh, we're in a pretty uh, intimate room right here. But uh, you know, I'm wearing a wrestling T-shirt. I, I gotta ask the first question here. Um, My favorite game, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Nintendo that. Wrestling. I yes, for the NES Classic. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, guys, feel free to uh, just put your hand up and we'll go to you for a question uh, throughout the room. Come on in, guys! <laughs> uh, what do you mean, though? <laughs> we should send somebody to tell them to make an announcement. Like, Curtis says she come in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sure, uh, who's, a, who's a wrestling fan in here? Yeah, these guys. So we can all agree that the late 90s was like, one of the pinnacles of professional wrestling. This guy was, you were lucky enough to be in that. So how did that all come about Like when you signed with WWF? It's a, it's a long story, but I don't know how much time do we have. Hey, good. <laughs> tell us, we want to know. Uh, it really, well, it all started 21, it was 21 years ago. I think this was 21 years ago, actually, 1996. I got, I got a call from, uh, an old friend of mine, a professional wrestler, I mean, his name is Leo Burke, he's a veteran wrestler, well known in Canada. He's from the East Coast, that's why I knew him. And, uh, but he trained Brett, when he, he, went, he worked for Stan B for his dad from the 70s, and so he knew Brett since Brett Hart since he was a kid. And he's one of the, Leo Burke, uh, he's one of the great minds in wrestling, great psychology, he wrestled all, all over the world. So anyways, I got a call from him, and uh, asked me if he wanted to fly up to Calgary to meet Brett, because at the time he was helping training guys. He really was one of the trainers at, uh, at, at Brett's house, home uh, in Calgary. And basically he trained the new guys for up and coming rising you know, the one the wrestlers new blood for WWF at the time. And, uh, and I think at the time they were forming a team as well for the, this with the old, the, the, the Duluth Commission came about. So, uh, so of course, I said yes. Uh, I, I, right away, he flew me out to, that's pretty exciting news. Well, I thought at the time wrestling was, my career was kind of slowing down a bit. I started in the maritime, did overseas tours. But I was, you know, slowed down, doing the bouncing thing, doing the, the bouncers and, and the doorman <laughs> podcast stuff. You know. Yeah, a typical frame for that. Yeah, in wrestling, yeah, I was getting far and far away. You know, the business that was going kind of slow back home as well, no promotion going on. But uh, that, yeah, when I got that call, I thought, yeah, well, that's, that was cool. Nice call to have. So I was a flew down to Calgary. Met Brett for the first time, which was pretty exciting. And uh, I spent a month there at his home, uh, at his ring, a ring, the WWF ring set up over his swimming pool. Really? <laughs> Indoor swimming pool in the middle of December. And uh, basically, just to see if, uh, if, if I know all the basic stuff. Because it's been years since I hit the ring, you know, uh, so I was a bit rusted. Just the basic stuff, lock ups, headlocks. Stuff like that, take, how to take a bump and all that. But Jen, you already, but just wanted to make sure, you know. And after a month of it, staying there, they thought I was uh, ready for it. He was happy with the results. And, and from there, I met, uh, they flew me down to Stanford, Connecticut now. If you're WWF fans, you know, Stanford is the, uh, the headquarters of the WWE. Of the WWE. Uh, with Vince's office and all that, they have all airport in Stanford. And they have also, as you said, a TV station. But uh, not a couple blocks away, and they're uh, like a training facility. And, uh, and that's where I met all the, the, my Truth Week Commission guys, my, my partners, met them for the first time. We spent a couple weeks there, how to work together as a tag team, I guess. And then from there, uh, that's where I met Vince. It's, it's pretty intimidating, actually. It's like meeting God. You know? <laughs> it was a pretty intimidating day. He was a nice man, but you know, he had so much power. You know? 
he could break you if he wanted to and have a career in wrestling. And he always meets individually with everybody that he brings on. Yeah, I remember his first impression of me where he came in the studio. We were in the ring training with you know, uh, and I was uh, I saw him coming in. You know, it's Vince, but they, he, he liked my face. You know, I make a great expression with my face, so that was a good thing. So, and uh, so yeah, he likes big guys. You know, so so that, was, that was a plus too. <laughs> so yeah, met Vince, met you know, school, and then and then from there they sent us down to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Now uh, at the time, with the uh, the wrestling promotion uh, run by uh, Jerry Lawler. Uh, USWA, and so there was a kind of a farm league at the time. And uh, so they told us we would spend a month there just to, to work out, get experience and all that. A month, okay, two months, three months, four months in Memphis. This is, well, this is before Skype, <laughs> <laughs> before internet, before Facebook. You know. So I had to call home, my wife called my my wife to be, we were at the she was planning uh, a wedding at the time. So, yeah, it was a tough four months. Uh, but it had to be done, I had to go through it to get us the way to get in. And uh, it was a sacrifice. And it worked out, it worked out. You know. At the end, we signed contracts. And, uh, we did a, a dark match, a trial match. And uh, at the end of, it, uh, of the Memphis uh, uh, tour, I guess. Uh, in Detroit, it was they did a Monday Night Raw in Detroit, and uh, they flew us to Detroit, and, and we did a dark match. Which was pretty nervous because it was do or die, you know, and uh, it worked out. We were happy with the match, and uh, and uh, signed the contracts, and yeah, it's been the next couple of years with them. So that was a hell of a ride. So, you know, it's basically, my dream, my, my dream come true because I wanted to be in the WWF, and it worked out. Was there a phone call that came in after that dark match that uh, told you, you know what, we're going to make you like a permanent part uh, of the TV team? It wasn't a, not like that. Uh, you know, we were booked for the next Raw uh, somewhere in Ohio, somewhere in Ohio for the next week. And, uh, uh, and then we signed, that's where I think we got introduced to our contracts right there, just give us paperwork to sign. And, you know, Basically, as simple as that, nothing to it. How did your wife react as you were planning the wedding and everything? Was she, was she really happy or was she a little upset? Well, I got back home. I got back yeah. after Memphis, did Memphis stuff. I got back home the day before the wedding. Uh, <laughs> and that was actually my flight was late. My flight was, uh, I missed my flight because uh, my, my, my chemical malfunction missed my connection. So I was supposed to be, be home on a Wednesday, but I got home on a Thursday and we got moved. The wedding was on a Friday, so it was just, it was tight. It was very, you know, but it worked out, you know, and I made it, and uh, we got, got married. Uh, she, of course, four months was a long time, four months away. You know, like I said, I, I didn't go back home for four months, maybe I couldn't afford it or didn't have the time for it. Memphis is far away from New Brunswick, so it's, it's, it was inconvenient a bit. Uh, so it was, it was tough on her, of course, you know, it was tough on me. But the, the, no, the, she, she knew about my dream, about the whole thing about wrestling, because she met me. She, she knew I was a wrestler, she knew the whole thing. She was ready for it. Uh, but when I signed the contract with WWF, the scheduling wasn't too bad. I was home every day, uh, every, every week. It's, it's not like four months away. Mm -hmm. I was home and, you know, every week. We did the tapings on the weekends uh, on Monday and Tuesday. And then I was home during the, every second weekend I was home, so it wasn't too bad, you know, so it worked out. Yeah. Do you guys have uh, wrestling questions you want to ask Robert? I got one. So I grew up in the wrestling, I always followed uh, Atlanta Grand Prix Wrestling. Yeah. Every single Saturday. Yeah, me too, me too, actually. Did you ever do any one of the uh, Dupree tours, as they call it? I started in Grand Prix Wrestling. So you did? I, yeah, 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 I started, I, I, I beg. I went up and over to see the old Prey. The old Prey is a promoter, well known promoter in Maritimes. Yeah, the Grand Prix Wrestling in the Brunswick, oh, in the Maritimes, uh, with his coach out PDI, and, uh, for 30 years. And uh, so, yeah, I was a big fan of it every Saturday, watching wrestling with my dad, watching live shows as well in my hometown when he came, when he came to tour. And so, but, yeah, when I got convinced myself that I wanted to be a wrestler, uh, 
but you do. There's no there you know, ready to go. So I figured let's go to see the promoter. So I went to his house. This is a half hour away from my place. And, uh, and I was 18 at the time. It wasn't big. It was I was always tall, of course, but uh, it wasn't filled out. <laughs> so, and he could look, look at me. You know, yeah, yeah, you you big, you big. Yeah, but uh, basically, he knew uh, he did, I needed more training, more work out in the, the gym more. So, uh, so, yeah, but I, what got me though, uh, I went to see a, a wrestler, one of his wrestlers, Steve Big, he was called Big Steve Pedagog, big man, 6'4, 270, and he wrestled over the world, Japan, Germany. And he was playing hockey in my hometown at the time, and uh, I said, who was Steve Pedagog? I knew he was. And I'm sure you know probably recognizing Stephen Pettipal. Yeah, him, uh, Cuban Assassin. Yeah, yeah, Cuban Assassin. Yeah. But so they were playing, uh, he was playing hockey, and I know I went to see him. And, uh, and he said, uh, if he could train me, but at the time he wasn't, uh, he wasn't training guys at the time. Was, uh, but he remembered me six months later during the summer, he called me up, asked me if I was, if I was still interested. And I uh, said, yeah, sure. And then I, uh, they needed guys to finish this, the, uh, the season, the circuit, the summer circuit. It was goals to May to September, and then it would finish for the year. But some of the guys left at the end of the, the tour, at the end of the summer, to go somewhere else. So they needed some, some guys to finish. So they brought me in, brought two, two, two other guys in to train. It was like a crash course in wrestling. It was exciting though. I had a ring set up at, at, a, at, a, at an arena, and it was my first forte in wrestling. It was very exciting, pretty, pretty cool stuff. And then, then after a month of it, not enough time to train, really, not enough time. I wasn't really ready for it. But they brought me to, 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 the, to, the, to the tour, the shows. And my first match was in my hometown, Bokhturs, with all my family, my friends. And that was, uh, was you know, yeah, there it is, I freaking yell. <laughs> but uh, luckily, my, 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 my partner was, uh, it was a tag team match, and my partner was my. The pedophile, you know, so basically, even if he did, I did, you know, so it was pretty easy. But yeah, it started from there, it was pretty exciting. So it may have worked out, eh? It worked out, and now, uh, automatically, I was a giant, I was a gimmick, <laughs> I was a drug. So they put me up in the event, that was the, the, the giant, <laughs> French giant. <laughs> and then black giant, maritime giant, the Belgian giant, the Canadian giant. Yeah, so it's funny. But yeah, that's my uh, first experience of being a pro wrestler. It's pretty cool. Just feel free to ask away, guys, if you if you got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we'll go we'll go to the guy in Star Wars, and we'll go to Gavin right in the back right after. Uh, this is in the origin of the name Kurgan, and were there other names thrown about that? Uh, there was a few names. Because I was called uh, when we start WWF and the Church Commission, they, they gave us all military names. I was the mm -hmm. interrogator. Mm -hmm. I was interrogator, tank, recon, uh, sniper. The commandant. Uh, uh, so when they, when they decided to split me up from the rest of the truth commission, because we have a single, it was me and the jackal. Yeah, they were the, the interrogator was this, you know, they wanted a, a name, first name for you know, the interrogator was just a title. Uh, so yeah, the names kind of popped up. I think I, I did think of names as well, trying to help, trying to get my input. I think it was Vince Russo, the one of the writers, head writers at the time, saw so Kurgan, given the name Kurgan. And Kurgan was from, that's an ancient name, but it's really, it's from the Highlander uh, movie, the first film, where the, the Kurgan. And, uh, and I think that they took it from that film. And it, it's a pretty awesome name. It is a cool name, it's a pretty strong name. So, so I was happy with that name. So. So often there was a list of like possible names. Yeah, I'm sure there was one. I'm sure there was. I forget the others. Nothing like Tad Chili. Nothing like Tad Chili. Tad Chili. But it got hurt and stuff. So that was not that good. Gavin, you had a question back there? Yeah, um, not that I'm saying anything scripted, but I'm, I'm wondering, especially with the WWE, was there ever a situation you may have heard of before where someone in a real big event didn't follow the script and maybe won a championship or did something that they weren't supposed to do? Oh, the wrong that he would have been fired enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so I know that sometimes that stuff happens. Well, I, you know what? You know, uh, I was there for the, uh, uh, the Montreal Screwdriver. 
Montreal screw Screwdrop, they call it, but Bret Hart got screwed by Vince. I was there that night, and that was not scripted. <laughs> that was not scripted. And I was there, it was in Montreal, of course, I was, I was part of the Survivor Series, and I worked on that show. And, uh, that was a, that was one of the highlights, you know, and in history in the making. How was it backstage after that? Weird, it was weird, because you know, all, all of it was quiet and shocked, really. Uh, we, we, we didn't, it was me and Barry Buchanan, who was my partner from the Drift Commission, but we were just about to go back, back home, go back to the hotel. But we knew it was the Brett's last match. We found that out that weekend, which was shocking to me, because the Brett was, you know, he helped me get into WWF, and you know, I was a great guy. And I thought, if, when you think Bret Hart, you think WWF forever. He started there for 14 years, you know, most of his life there. In his career, and then leaving for WCW it was like, what the hell, man? So that was, I was trying to get over that. And, uh, and then you see that finish, that, that finish, that was, you know, we were not in on the whole match at all. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't know any of the other politics involved in that. Then when we saw that screwy finish, uh, it was kept looking at my partner, but okay, let's go on. <laughs> let's go back to all that before the shit, shit, shit hits the floor. And, uh, <laughs> So we 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 were leaving. We we're about to leave into the dressing room, and of course that dressing room is where Sean Michaels and Brett were. And uh, so we got our bags, and then we got the road agents told us to stay because they were, they were thinking Sean and, uh, and Brett would, would have an altercation, a fight, because they didn't have a fight before months before they had a fight backstage. In, in the showers, apparently. And, uh, so they, they really had, they had some heat. They really hated each other. And uh, so they needed guys to separate them. And they were, great. They'd, they'd be involved in that. <laughs> Especially Brett. You know, this is Brett, like I said, Brett helped us while we want to stay in between, you know, in between getting involved. So we had no choice. We had to stay. So I remember Sean getting in first, coming in first, and then basically denying the whole his own involvement. Of course he didn't know the whole conspiracy later later. But at the time he denied it. Um, and, then, uh, and then Brett came in later and uh, asked Sean if had anything to do with it and of course no 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 blah blah blah. So we were there, you know, to, you know, to listen to that and thinking this whole hell's gonna be loose. But uh, and then and then Brett went to the showers, very quiet of course with puppies pretty pissed off, you know. The whole thing. But went to the showers, and then, uh, and then this is where Vince came in. That the Undertaker was pissed at Vince, but what he, what he did. So Undertaker physically convinced Vince to get out of his office. He was hiding in his office to to, to uh, face Brett. You know, and uh, so as I saw, saw Shane McMahon, saw all the agents coming in with Vince. And then then this is where they told us to uh, to leave. We're, we're very happy. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the dressing room, uh, we went to our cars, we went to the to the hotel, and then that's where they told us uh, where Brett punched bits after we left. Brett punched, uh, one punch knocked him out. Vince McMahon knocked out. So they were like, your we minds were a for blowing. <laughs> so it was a weird weekend, but all the weekend, especially the aftermath of it. Then the whole thing happened. A lot of the boys were divided. You know, they, they hated what Vince did to Brett. And then so some of them wanted to leave. A lot, a lot of them did leave. Most of the Brett family, like David Boyd Smith and Mango. Owen stayed, you know, Owen Hart, his brother stayed. But uh, it was a yeah, weird uh, you know, situation. And stuff. But it was kind of cool to be part of it. Yeah, yeah right over here. So um, that was like in the. Later in the middle of the Monday Night Wars, yeah. was there like backstage, like kind of a us versus them mentality between some people? Or? Not really. All the boys are the boys. Uh, we're all friends with the WCW. They're all the same. The boys, right? We're all just working for different companies. So, so. I remember we we're all we we're at the hotel, and we, the WCW was in town as well. And uh, there was zero, so we all shared the same hotel. So WCW guys and WWF guys. And the boys, you know, we all got together. There was no rivalry at all. You know, I met Scott Hall, Ken Nashville, that were there, and all good, nice, good guys. But uh, 
No, I wouldn't say it would. Yeah. Maybe it would the office. Yeah. With the events, the rivalry between Vince and Ted Turner, maybe, and the whole, you know, and other boys, you know, they didn't see that at all. Yeah, question You never worked for WCW, did you? No. Uh, the reason I ask, so back then, Eric Bischoff, you know, especially was one of those guys who was cherry picking from the WWE. Yeah. So, no one that you're closest with, Brett, were you ever thinking about maybe jumping the ship? No. No. I wasn't. Never. Really. I never got asked or offered to go to the WCW. Uh, I'm happy I didn't, though. Yeah, WCW was, not, was very disorganized. Yeah, it, it was pretty, uh, a lot of wrestlers stayed home. They get paid and stay home. There are so many wrestlers that they, 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 some of them never, never been used. So they got paid, but they've never been on, on the show. Yeah. So, the WWF was the place to be. Vince knew how to create wrestlers, he knew how to create superstars. You know? and, uh, but, but WCW was just a TV. Ted uh, Jr. was a uh, you know, only network. He wasn't a wrestling guy. Vince, Vince grew up in wrestling. Family, his family is in wrestling. So he knew, he knew the whole wrestling world. Ted Jr. did you know? so. So it was very disorganized, but so I'm happy I didn't go. You know, some guys did shine, did break through, you know, but for me it was WWF. That was my, uh, my goal. I'm happy I stayed there. So since you stayed there, what went wrong with the truth commission? What went wrong? It ran its course. And then all of a sudden, the audience. Well, the truth commission worked. This, this is the whole game. There was a whole gang thing going on that summer that year. Yeah, we were the Truth Commission. There were four of us, and then they had a DOA. The Cycles of uh, Apocalypse. And then they got the. Uh, uh, the Rick Russ. And then they got the Nation of Domination. Um, and then the DX, of course. You know, so there's a lot of gangs. The Survivor Series was all gang stuff, right there, match. And then they kind of they died off. After that, they kind of boom. And then so they got it separated. And so that's how I happened in the truth commission. And the oddities, uh, it's far started with, uh, I think the whole idea with the, the Howard Stern thing going on. They see freaks, you know, Howard Stern, and the celebrities to get from the Howard Stern show. And uh, I think it was the, Don Callis, was the uh, Jack idea to form a human, a human oddity. It was more of a heel gimmick, really, for the freak show. But uh, instead, yeah, instead, yeah, and then, but it, and then, but if they got, but they, 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 they let the jackal go, they let him go, and uh, the oddities. Uh, that's where it turned to a fun-loving group, yeah, you know, clowns everywhere, and uh, they didn't know what to do with me for a while after the whole curly thing. And they, they put me over the oddities. And then, and then the, that's the, the whole idea with the, the, new, the new direction of the oddities is that I got a call from Vince Russo, the, the head writer, which I never got a call from him ever before. So I was like, all right. <laughs> that was, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I was going to get fired or whatever. But uh, he, just, he pitched the idea of uh, the whole oddities, fun loving guys, having a party. And, and, uh, and the, the, the whole intro of it to introduce the, 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 the whole idea is to uh, dress up in tuxedos and Luna Vachon to have dressed up as a princess and escorting her down to the ring while I sing Miss America. <laughs> it was like, I was going to say no, but uh, you know, I said yes. It was a good, it's an opportunity, I would say. And it, yeah, so it's on tape, it's on YouTube or, or somewhere. Daily, daily, uh, daily, uh, maybe it was the other video streaming, daily, daily motion. Daily motion. Yeah. So, you had a question at the back there? Yeah, I have a, a non-wrestling related question. Have you ever been approached to do any voice work or animation? Uh, I did an audition for a voice. Uh, actually, there's a new trailer coming out, a uh, new movie coming out. Uh, it's an animation for the movie. It's the one I auditioned for. Yeah, the, 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 the Islands of Dogs or Dog and Isles of Dogs? Yeah, uh, Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson. Yeah. I auditioned for that. That was really? like a year ago. 
put uh, like a year ago. And in one of them, they put uh, my voice, I was at home, and it was a self tape, and I put my voice on, uh, on my iPhone and I sent it to them. They wanted the lowest voice, the lowest voice I could, and I was like, the lowest I could. So yeah, I, I, did, I did audition for that. Yeah. You have a, I work in animation, you have a fantastic voice for Thank animation. you. Yeah, I mean, I love to do that. I love to do that. <laughs> you have a great voice for radio, that's a good thing. What? Show them after the show. With the French accents, I don't know. French accents, right? Yes, you have a question there. I have a non-wrestling relationship. Yeah, yeah, we were going to shift gears anyway, so you're taking your hands. Uh, see you there. So, You've had so many movie roles that required such physicality. Which yeah. one would you say has required more from you yeah. physically out of the either 300 or at home? Physically? Yes. Uh, Pacific Rim? Well, Pacific Rim was stuff physically. Uh, if you've seen the movie, Pacific Rim, we're, we're, we're all we're pilots in this huge role. You know, Diego, robots, you know, giant robots. And so we were all strapped in, pretty much, you know, our arms were strapped in, and we had this elliptical machine, our, our feet were strapped in, so we were walking. And that was very tough. That was very tough, physically, you know. We, so you have to do, we had to be uh, uh, synced with the, like, the actors I worked with at the same time, so there was a lot of rehearsals for that beforehand. But it was uh, on, you know, on a gimbal, too, it was a moving. And water splash at us, and sparks, or smoke and sparks. And so it was pretty uh, intense, and we were blind. The whole thing, we had a visor, so we were completely blind. And, uh, so we had the one with Altor in our ear directing us, and we had, had a dance coordinator as well for our beats, you know, boom, boom, boom and all that stuff. We, and uh, that was very tough physically. We had, a, for safety reasons, we had a harness underneath, and we had a a cable attached to the side to keep us balanced and above us too. So during the breaks when they were shooting, yeah, they couldn't get us out. It took 45 minutes to to get out of the whole thing. So time, you know, it's too much time. So basically, we just like a marionette, you know, just <laughs> and the cable held our, held our uh, the weight, you know, they held us up. So we, we could really take a nap. It was very comfortable actually. They were all wet and cold. Yeah, you know, for like four or five hours in that set. Because it was all physical effects, right? Physical that effects, was yeah. It was a four-story high gimbal uh, head. It was just, it was just crazy, intense. It was pretty intense. We weren't that bad. Compared to Charlie Hunnam, who was the star, he was there all the time for like the whole shoot, pretty much. So he, he went through it all, too. It was just amazing. One question. Uh, gotta ask now that we're on the movie topic. What's the story about when you were filming Sherlock Holmes? You punch Robert Downey Jr. in the face? That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. How did that all go down? <laughs> Everybody, but still doing Iron Man. He's fine. Yeah. He's okay. No, it was a. Uh, it was a long, the long week. You know, the, the, the whole fight to see Sherlock Holmes. It's the whole fight in the at the dockyards, on the boat, a lot of the swinging and stuff, a lot of uh, action going on, and, and very technical stuff too. Uh, yeah, it, we rehearse the fight and then and then it changes. We rehearse it without down, down it over without Robert because he's busy acting, so we rehearse it with a stunt double, okay, blah, 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 we'll do that, that's fine. Then you, you, you bring it on the fight on set to introduce it to them, and Robert wants to change things, that's fine, okay. And the guy reaching the director, they must change it. So they think the whole fight changes, but there's not enough time to rehearse. You know, they don't have the window opportunity to rehearse. So, okay, this is shit happens, but <laughs> 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 and of course, I remember the fight sequence was uh, I was supposed to jab him like that, but he was supposed to block it and hit him in the chest, and then he still fall back behind the barrels. And that was that was the that was the, 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 the stunt. But it happened so fast that he forgot to block. <laughs> so, of course, I, you know, I, I still went towards his face, you know, and I hit him very, 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 very cool. <laughs> And I have it on tape, I do have it on tape. I didn't share it, I won't share it there. But I have it on The guy called it called his stunt uh, uh, assistant, fight assistant, called him his camcorder. <laughs> uh, uh, 
this, which is a good thing. This, this is good evidence. It was, a, it was good. Quite that I it wasn't my fault. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, I felt terrible. You know, I remember hitting them, connecting, and I was like, shit. <laughs> I just hit a guy that's worth $10 million. <laughs> and all the financial guys were nervous. <laughs> so, and he was dragging himself. It was, he fell, he was dragging himself until blood came out of his mouth. And I was chasing him. Are you all right? You okay? Sorry, sorry. And for a few seconds, they said, well, they thought it was part of the, the, the choreographed fight until they realized it wasn't there. And it was, well, I was nervous that I broke something. Uh, nose, face, teeth, whatever. Uh, uh, but he had a he cut his lip with his tooth and the uh, bone inside. But he had to have five stitches <laughs> afterward. We finished the fight, we were, we were about to swallow him, so they put some ice, and then we finished our fight for that night, and then they took him to the hospital and they the stitches. But the next day, uh, I remember I was in the makeup, uh, makeup uh, chair, and he came to the, the, to the makeup uh, Trailer. And without saying a word, you know, I was just, hey, good, well, before I said good morning, you know, I said, just drop the get back, boom, and left. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, it was a, a, a champagne, a bottle of champagne, and a nice card where she wrote personally, sorry, let's get through this, stories. It was a very classy guy, so, yeah, very good guy, so, yeah, he knew I felt that. <laughs> It all worked out. It was good afterwards for me. It's funny because he hit the tabloids in, the, in, the, in the England. You know, uh, a wrestler knocks, knocks out Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part was extra. An extra hit uh, knocks out Robert Downey. An extra. I'm not an extra. An extra <laughs> background actor. So I wasn't background. Stunt man, that's fine. You know, the extra, you know. But no, it's pretty, it went viral. They went to had Entertainment Tonight, went to North of yeah, they had all over the world. It was like great. <laughs> My family saw it and it was like, Jesus, you know, they all had a good life. Yeah. But it was good publicity though. They brought me to Montreal the week before the release to do press. But the first, I did about 20 interviews and the first question was about that. Thing. So it was good though. Yeah, it was good, it was good, it was good publicity at the end. Nobody got hurt, seriously. So. It's good. He was even mentioned on David Letterman too. It was on the late show with David. <laughs> and he told us, mention my name, mention the story. Punch her around the world. Punch her around the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who else got a question? Yeah, right here. Uh, let's hear how you transitioned from wrestling into acting. Uh, well, I do a lot of physical stuff, action stuff, so it's pretty, it's pretty easy to change like that. 300 was a uh, player of uh, a org, uh, monster. So I remember Zack Snyder coming up to me and this, giving me my first direction. And I was all freaking four or five hours of makeup, prosthetics, you know, just looked like a freaking ugly monster. And then uh, Zack came up and just do like, this yeah. All right, I can do that. It's my routine in wrestling. Yeah. And uh, that's what I did. And I remember the crowds, the, the, uh, the crew, they you know, applauded. They were, you know, they were shocked, you know. They were very happy. That so was a good sign. I was doing a good job. So, so yeah, I do a lot of physical stuff and some of my own stunts and stuff. Most sometimes, too. Yeah. I do have a stunt little bit sometimes. It's, it's, but uh, the Sean Holmes did all my own stunts. You know, there was pulling through doors and falling through, jumping off of windows. It was scary. Very scary to me. You know, I'm afraid of heights. You know. <laughs> but uh, so the physical aspects, yeah, I bring that to the stage. I fight, bring that from wrestling. I know how to, you know, I know how to conduct myself. How did you get involved with acting? Oh well, it's true. Um, well, 300. I did some that over acting stuff back home. You know, did some stuff in Halifax. Uh, I worked on shows like Lex. TV series, an episode that was my first gig. And then I did uh, work for a show called Comedy Central, it was called uh, Biography, Leslie and Nielsen. It was a, it was a kind of a spoof from the AME biography. And uh, I played a wrestler in that one, and that had some dialogue. So it was my first foray into it. And, uh, but my first big break was for him. And how they got to involved, uh, the contact me was, it was also in Montreal. And uh, they need a big guy, of course, to play that role. And you know, audition with a lot of big guys who 
you know, they turn out. And there were some of the, uh, the stunt guys, local stunt guys, knew a wrestler, Jacques Rougeau, the Rougeau brothers. Yeah, one of them wrestling family in Montreal. And, and they had a wrestling school, we went to see him, Jacques Rougeau, and asked him if he knew if he was a big guy to do it. They needed a stunt actor to do it, right? So, and uh, so he mentioned me, gave him my, my name, my contact, and he got the call the next day. They flew me to Montreal, like kind of a uh, small audition to see if I was, you know, a big guy. So, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and I got the part there later that day. So he's a true wrestling guy, contacts very much. So, yeah, that's how I got started. Slowly got started from there, you know. And then, and then Sherlock Holmes came about, you know, through 300. Because of, because of 300, so it's, you know, open more doors and opportunities and so on. Have you hired the strain because of Gamma Gamma the Pacific Rim. Oh, yeah. Pacific Rim, yeah. yeah I did a movie called The Big Bang, not The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> it's the same. Big Bang was a small indie film, so I was in Spokane, Washington. Uh, uh, I auditioned for it, they needed a... Uh, 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 Send a feet guy, foot guy, a Russian guy. The, the character was a Russian uh, boxer, and I, I auditioned for it. And uh, I was so happy to get it because uh, I was, Antonio Banderas was the lead, was the star, and I had Snoop Dogg <laughs> was, was there too. And uh, uh, Sam Elliott was my wife's favorite freaking actor. I think every woman's favorite actor was Sam Elliott. <laughs> and uh, it's an amazing cast. Thomas Critzman, you know, he's in the Avengers. And, uh, Bill Fitzner, character actors, well known, and a symbol of actors, amazing. And then, uh, and then I auditioned for it for the Russian part, and, uh, and I got the role. And, then, and that movie was, I had a great role, actually. All my scenes was with Antonio, it was just awesome. It was a dramatic role. It was very dramatic compared to all the monster, dark guy parts, it was more of a drama, more of, a, more of an acting, you know. And anything else. I was very happy with my performance in that role. And then uh, it was an indie film, nobody really saw it, and all this kind of to give you and stuff. But Guillermo del Toro saw it. And he liked my performance, and he offered me a part in Pacific Rim, which is, that's it, the, another Russian. <laughs> and then from there, he offered me a part to play the master on his training. So, there you go. From the Big Bang, small movie, to Good opportunities from there, so that's good. We got time for uh, maybe one or two more. I uh, got them. Yeah, five minutes left. Has anybody got a question here? Yeah. So, considering the makeup stuff that you've had to go through for 300 and then for the strain, which was harder? 300. Okay. 300 was a long process because you know, the prosthetics was, took long enough, a couple hours to go to prosthetics, but uh, I had like 24 scars all over my back. My, all over my body, really, and uh, so they took time to glue, you know, and then they had to spray, uh, uh, latex paint to spray to mask the head and the body. So it was a full five hours uh, the process. And uh, one night, uh, one day, they asked me to sleep with it. I think it was sleep, it was just the same time. And it's, like, it's a good thing that one of the older uh, 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 stunt guys found out what was going on. So this, he made sure that I was on the clock. I was paid for it, as always. But yeah, I, I had to go. I said yes just because I never did this. I did before. Uh, I was, this is in Montreal, two in the morning, uh, October or November, I think. And I got into the lobby, and you know, all the, the staff were like, they weren't sure. They knew it was me, but they weren't sure. I had the whole Uber makeup and <laughs> stuff. So, and I met the driver I was with, he escorted me to my room, make sure I didn't freak out the guests. <laughs> and I had to sleep on my back. And, and I had to put baby powder and, you know, on the sheets, make sure I didn't sting. Uh, so long two days. I was so happy when they got the makeup off. They did it at the end. It's just happy I did it though, but it's just not really tough. But, you know, it was a long, a long process. You know. So yeah, uh, the, uh, the strain wasn't so bad. The wardrobe was very heavy. On the strain. Makeup was three hours, which wasn't, wasn't bad. But you know, the wardrobe, the, 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 the cloak itself is like 100 pounds. It was very, very heavy. I had to wear platform boots. Apparently, I'm not tall enough. <laughs> 6'10 is not giant enough. So yeah. I had to wear, I, I feel like a, like a kiss. 
<laughs> and that was awkward to walk for you too. Yeah. But I look big and powerful, so people are like, walking to the set there, obviously, the way the best is coming. Awesome. Right on, guys. Well, hey, thanks for your questions. Let's give a hand to Robert and I today for hanging out with us here for the last little while. And, uh, we appreciate you coming to London, and I hope to see you again, man. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Sure.